Kia ora koutou. Good morning to everyone. And it uh, was a very impressive opening um, and, and very nice, uh, tuneful uh, presentation. So thank you to everyone. Um, it, it is my great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Professor Natasha Hamilton Hart, who will present a Nicholas Tarning lecture. So before I introduce Natasha, uh, in the unlikely case of someone not knowing um, Nicholas Tarling, I will explain what this lecture is about. Oh, so, um, hasn't heard hasn't heard of Nicholas Tarling, and there are a, a number of opportunities you could have um, uh, bumped into uh, Professor Nicholas Tarling. Um, if you follow Asian studies, if you're a student of University of Auckland where he was a dean, if you are an opera lover and, um, and you could uh, see him regularly there, um, or you followed some uh, education policy discussions and uh, um, uh, similar activities. So um, Nicholas Tarling, uh, Professor Tarling was the driving force behind the creation of the New Zealand Asian Studies Society. And uh, at uh, Asian Studies, um, Con biennial conferences, uh, the society honors his vision and commitment uh, to the promotion of Asian studies um, and with this uh, Nicholas Starling lecture. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, I owe uh, something else to Nicholas Starling and that is that thanks to him, I met with uh, Professor Natasha Hamilton Hart for the first time, I believe, which was many years ago in uh, Vanuatu when both of us attended uh, an Asian conference <clears throat> seminar, which was organized by uh, the uh, Institute of Asian Studies. Um, and um, uh, Nicholas Starling was one of the conveners uh, of that uh, event. So um, Professor Natasha Hamilton Hart is director of the New Zealand Asia Institute and professor in Department of Management and International Business at the University of Auckland Business School. Um, she has, uh, Natasha has a very impressive bio. You can read about that in, in, the, in the booklet, but uh, I just want to highlight one important um, uh, aspect of her um, um, you know, competence is that um, it is not very often that we come across academics who uh, work across various disciplinary lanes. Um, and uh, when I read about Natasha, I see that she has uh, competence and, and, and knowledge and publications in the area of business and management, but she has been equally prominent in international studies, international security studies, uh, looking at the role of uh, major powers, the role of rise of China, uh, and, and other uh, activities broadly uh, in the Asia Pacific region, or I don't know whether we call it Asia Pacific, we call it Indo Pacific. Yeah, hopefully, you can uh, help us there as well, Natasha. So, um, the presentation today uh, is titled In Search of Southeast Asia, and uh, Natasha will um, walk us uh, through her understanding of some key trends uh, in Southeast Asian studies and, um, and maybe uh, the opportunities uh, for us to uh, shift from study of out there to a platform for collaboration. And I think that's a wonderful uh, um, a way to uh, introduce this um, presentation because we as academics sometimes are criticized for not being practical and helpful. And I think uh, Natasha uh, is someone who can uh, reconcile uh, these uh, scholarly and practical um, ways of dealing with uh, Asia and Southeast Asia in particular. So I will disappear now. Um, you can ask your questions through the Q&A icon. Um, and uh, at closer to the end of the, um, this session, uh, Natasha will uh, respond to, to your questions and we'll have a discussion. So all over to you and I will disappear for, 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 for some time, Natasha. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I would like to start by thanking um, the organizers, Penny Shino, the New Zealand uh, Asian Studies Association, and of course, the Nicholas Tarling Charitable Trust. I saw Tara Young Werners uh, on, the, on, the, on the lineup today um, somewhere. Hello, Tara. Um, hello to you all who are online this morning. I'm glad you could make it. I'm sorry not to be in Palmerston North. Um, I want to start by taking you through a, a little bit of an overview of a sort of pathway that I have walked from Southeast Asian studies um, uh, at the beginning of my professional career 
to where we are now. Um, and so the title of this talk comes, of course, from the history text In Search of Southeast Asia, um, which was edited by David Steinberg. And it features a luminary, luminary lineup of scholars of Southeast Asian history who made their names in the 1960s and 70s. And this, this 1985 edition was the one that um, was used when I first arrived in the National University of Singapore in 2001 to teach our compulsory first year course on Southeast Asian studies. And it's a weighty kind of book. It's um, a few hundred pages long and it has no pictures. It has a couple of maps and it proceeds in a very sort of orderly chronological way, starting in the 18th century and sort of coming to the middle of the 20th century or so. And it was, I have to say, it was already kind of anachronistic by the time that we were using it um, for the last time at the beginning of 2001. And it was soon replaced as our first year text by Mary Summers Hyde, who's Southeast Asia, A Concise History, which is much more accessible and friendly to undergraduates. It has pictures, it has a bit of the old, but also quite a lot of the new. It organizes itself not so much in terms of a chronology, but in terms of thematic uh, approaches. So it looks at waterways, at temples, at rice, beliefs, violence, and so on. And while this is a sort of different ordering schema for approaching the region, um, it is equally comfortable, I would say, for someone who started looking at Southeast Asia as a region the way I did, which was when I started graduate school at Cornell University in the 1990s, I was introduced to a way of looking at a particular part of the world and thinking of it in terms of not just the economics or just the business history, but um, that there was value in having a look at a particular part of the world in a much broader way and getting a much deeper and broader kind of understanding of the things that had gone on. When I came back to, South, uh, to New Zealand in 2011, um, the third book, uh, Southeast Asia and New Zealand uh, by Anthony Smith or edited by Anthony Smith, um, captures something of what I found here, which is that nobody much was very interested in Southeast Asia. Um, I was never asked to speak about Southeast Asia. I was mostly asked to speak about New Zealand and Indonesia or New Zealand and Malaysia. Um, and this, I think it's, it's not the only thread, of course, there are, uh, but it was the one I found that was most in demand when I interacted with government officials or others, um, that that was that they were looking for a New Zealand hook as a way of getting into the region. Um, a few years later, of course, and some of you may recognize this final graphic, um, which is quite somewhat alarming as a way of sort of looking at the region, perhaps. You may recognize the signature colors of the Southeast Asia Center for Asia Pacific Excellence. Um, and I guess my talk today is how did we arrive at this? Um, this particular way of, in an institutional sense, uh, disseminating uh, knowledge about Southeast Asia and getting to know the region. So I will um, flick back in time slightly. Um, oops, I have to go back here. Um, and point to the fact that I think will be familiar to many of you that when area studies um, or approaches to understanding Southeast Asia as a region first to began, it was often noted that uh, the field of study was shaped by the demands of the states right from the colonial era uh, and then World War II and then the Cold War and to the present, that the strategic context, um, even if it was very far from being of the primary interest of any of the scholars studying the region, nonetheless shaped their understanding of the region. And in fact, when we go back uh, and say, look at modern Southeast Asia starting in the colonial era, uh, 
um, that it was state requirements, in this case, the requirements of colonial states to know something about the region that they were trying to occupy, that gave um, the impetus and indeed many of the materials for the study of Southeast Asia. And this first image um, is the book, the first book I read really about Southeast Asia, which was The Fashioning of Leviathan by John S. Furnival. Um, written, uh, well, it appeared for the first time in 1939. And it is now, of course, recognized as a classic account of state building. When I read it, it was introduced as compulsory reading in um, Benedict Anderson's course on the plural society, um, which was taught for many, many years at Cornell University. And I was lucky enough to study with him. Um, and he got us to read this uh, rather entertaining account of uh, the administrative beginnings of the colonial state in Burma in the early 19th century. Uh, sometimes comical, always often plaintive. Um, and of course, at that time, it was not Southeast Asia, though, it was Burma. And it was the beginnings of uh, British, what later became known as British Burma and uh, then progressed as the British influence spread to uh, British Malaya and uh, other parts of the region. But Fernpool also, I think, was one of the first to use the term Southeast Asia as a region. And this book of his educational progress in Southeast Asia appeared in 1943, uh, which of course was a wartime context. And many of you will recognize the picture of the man who stands in the third image as Lord Mountbatten, who is often credited with first sort of bringing the term Southeast Asia into wide use as a strategic area command of the theater of battle in World War II. Um, and at the time of, um, as many of you will know, Southeast Asia included Sri Lanka, then Ceylon, uh, and therefore the boundaries of the region have clearly shifted. And only, only 10 years later, with the formation of the military pact, the Southeast Asia Treaty uh, Organization, which was envisaged by the United States and its allies as a sort of Pacific twin uh, to the NATO North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Um, and that was another way of imagining the region. Um, let me just to, to sort of underline the playfulness of regional boundaries. Um, this is the Southeast Asia of the CETO. Um, this is a French graphic, so they've called it Otaz, Okinet, um, but it shows you the member states in dark blue, along with the paler blue colonies of the member states, and then the, um, I guess it's because this is a French uh, graphic, the states underneath the protection of CETO, which is their colonies, which of course they are beginning to, they are fighting for now in uh, Indochina. But the remit of CETO stretching to Pakistan and New Zealand and Australia, as well as the Philippines and Thailand, shows you just how arbitrarily the region's boundaries could be drawn. Um, it, I don't want to say that the Southeast Asian studies as a field of study served only uh, military or strategic aims, because clearly many of the pioneering scholars who established Southeast Asia as a field of study were actually very sharply critical of the US policy during the Cold War in particular. Um, but it is still the case that um, a rather belated recognition on the part of the United States that they should really know their enemy, uh, including the communists in Southeast Asia as they saw them, that actually provided the institutional funding and motives and means for greatly increased study of the region. Um, and this is a tale that has been told by many leading scholars of the region, including Benedict Anderson, but also O.W. Walters, Donald Emerson and others, which was how the Cold War context shaped our understanding and the scholarship that was produced on Southeast Asia. I think, um, to just highlight some of the strands of that, um, that story, um, Benedict Anderson in his introduction to his book on the Southeast Asia, The Spectre of Comparisons, 
um, he pointed out that the Cold War um, led to the training of a whole generation of scholars and created a set of institutional legacies in the form of centers for Southeast Asian studies, such as at Cornell and Yale and other parts of the US. Um, which meant that um, even though some of these scholars, such as Cairn, who wrote this book, Subversion as Foreign Policy, um, very, very critical of the United States uh, attempts at subversion in Burma and uh, Indonesia in the 1950s, and then, of course, full-scale war in Indochina in the 60s and 70s. Um, or nonetheless, their opportunities to study the region and the systems of language scholarships and foreign students that came to the US to study from the region and grew up alongside each other as, as scholars in many ways. Um, I think in, in Anderson's term, terms, this, this created the field of the re studying the region rather than the individual countries of the region because the fact that they institutionalized the teaching of Southeast Asia in these centers for Southeast Asian studies and collected the library materials such as the Eccles collection at Cornell in a unified library of Southeast Asia with an extraordinary archive meant that even if your primary interest was the Philippines or Indonesia, you would go to seminars and brown bag lunches and you would get to know people who were studying some other part of the region and you would learn a little bit about other countries and other issues affecting this one part of the world and that is why the sort of comparative lens the approach to thinking if you knew about indonesia you might compare with the philippines or if you worked on malaysia you might compare with thailand and so on this approach to studying the region took off at this time, where was New Zealand? Um, now, I listened with interest to Professor Anthony Reid's Nicholas Tarling lecture that he delivered two years ago for NZ Asia. And he pointed out that uh, the Cold War context was also an impetus for studying the region in New Zealand um, that was shaped by the concerns of the Cold War, but also a kind of um, somewhat idealistic set of ideas about improving the situation in the region. And he points it out that Asian studies was established at Victoria University in Wellington in 1957, that the teaching of Indonesian language began in the University of Auckland in 1968 and in Victoria a year later in 69. If you're interested in a picture from the 1970s, um, these four men are um, speaking got brought together at the first Australian Asian Studies Association conference in Melbourne in 1974. And on the far right, you have um, Nicholas Tarling looking very different from the Nicholas Tarling that I knew when I arrived in Auckland in 2011. And of course, also a younger Tony Reid uh, from the 70s as well. Um, Nicholas Tarling, um, was probably the most influential uh, scholar of Southeast Asia um, residing in New Zealand um, for these decades. I would note that um, as a, there's a sort of micro level ripple from New Zealand's involvement in Cold War conflicts in this, in this era, the middle picture um, is from the New Zealand History uh, website where it says this is a picture of the 1st Battalion of the New Zealand Regiment prepares to leave camp for a six day patrol in Malaya, in Pahang, I think this is actually a picture of. And one legacy of this involvement of New Zealand troops in Malaya um, and of course later in fighting in the emergency that this time this was um, uh, this was the emergency against the communist uh, insurgency in Malaya, was that um, many, many decades later, when I was a young public servant uh, in Wellington in the 90s, I found a language training manual for learning to speak Indonesian um, in the cupboard, and nobody had used it for decades, I think, and it taught me all the useful vocabulary, such as telling the private to, you know, clean his rifle and um, 
everyone should assemble in front of the barracks. Um, and I believe this must have been a legacy, not of the emergency, but of the Indonesian confrontation of Malaya, when New Zealand also uh, stood ready to provide support. By the time the Vietnam War had ended, and there had been, of course, a very strong anti-war movement in New Zealand, um, interest in Southeast Asia seemed to die away. And I'm, I'm, I'm basing that assessment on um, Tony Reid's presentation, where he said when he came back for a semester uh, to teach at, uh, or to have a sabbatical at um, the University of Auckland, I think it was, in New Zealand, he said Southeast Asia just seemed so far away from New Zealand. Uh, there was no longer that close sense of being involved in the region's uh, events. Nonetheless, um, there was Nicholas Tarling, there were Leonard and Barbara and Dyer of Auckland and other leading scholars of the region. And of course, this set of books that you can see on the right hand side of your screen is the Cambridge history of um, Southeast Asia, which was edited by Nicholas Tarling. Um, it appeared in 1992 as a, quite, a, a sort of monumental effort to chronicling the region's history. Um, I think it's notable that there is a second edition of um, the Cambridge History of Southeast Asia, which is underway now. And one of the general editors is Barbara Andaya, who is now, of course, at Hawaii, and it is also being steered primarily from scholars um, at ANU in um, Canberra. It will have two uh, New Zealand contributors. So the, the, the thread has not been, has not been lost. Uh, in terms of New Zealand's involvement in Southeast Asian studies from the periphery. However, um, it certainly took a little bit of a battering. Um, sorry, I seem to have skipped uh, ahead. Um, because by the time um, the 1990s roll around and the Cold War is over and the story in town is the phenomenal economic growth of Southeast Asia, um, we really see um, a falling away, I think, of the whole approach to studying the region in depth in a broad sense, the sort of the area studies approach. Um, as an undergraduate at the University of Otago in the 19, late 1980s, I do not recall a single course on Asian politics or societies that was offered to me as a student of politics, Russian and French at the University of Otago. Now, I haven't gone back to check their course books offerings, but I'd be interested to know what they even offered in disciplines such as history and, and anthropology, because um, so political studies at the time didn't seem to offer anything on Asia. And then when I moved to Wellington to, in a sense, be part of the public sector um, in the early 90s, um, APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Arena that was going to bring um, free markets and open up the region as an economic space uh, of rising prosperity, APEC, which was established in 1989, that was the flavor of the day. Um, in a way, APEC, I think, um, meant that Asia, in the view of the minds of those in Wellington, was kind of on the cusp of not really being Asian at all, in the sense that mm. the assumption was that Asia would liberalize, it would adopt Anglo-American standards of cor corporate governance, it would open up its markets, it would become part of the global economy, and adopt WTO compliant regulatory systems. And in a sense, it would stop being distinctively Asian, uh, at least as far as business and government was concerned. There was of course a pushback to this vision of, of Asia, um, the APEC vision. And that came, I think most prominently from the prime minister of Malaysia, Mahathir Mohamad, who launched his rival regional group um, called the East Asian Economic Caucus, um, which was dubbed a, a caucus without the Caucasians because it would be East Asians only. Um, and it, it said something about a different aspiration for the region. Um, in Wellington in the early nineties, nobody wanted to know about this. I think the attitude towards Mahathir 
was absolutely contemptuous. Um, it wasn't taken seriously. Uh, nobody made the great faux pas that Paul Keating from Australia did at the time, which was to call uh, Mahatia recalcitrant, which caused great offence. Um, but I think privately, the attitude was just as dismissive. Um, that picture, by the way, um, which captures something of the um, awkwardness of the APEC meeting at the time, uh, where you see both Mahatia and Paul Keating looking a great deal younger than they are now, um, but also clearly looking um, extremely uncomfortable in each other's presence. There's our Prime Minister of the time, uh, Jim Bolger, looking cheerful um, nonetheless. Now, I think that the attitude of Wellington officialdom, or the, which went, I think that extended to much of the business community at the time, was, was odd. They really didn't want to know what was driving this Mahatir-esque vision of the region, but not just Mahatir, others who, who wanted to say that their region was really something other than just on the way to becoming like Anglo-America. Um, but I think the New Zealand attitudes at the time were heavily influenced by the prevailing current of what is often called neoliberalism or the, the deregulatory liberalizing thrust that we had just uh, taken to our own government and business system. Um, and this meant that there is no alternative. New Zealand had had to go through this wrenching process of economic reform and Asia would have to as well. Um, the architect of those reforms, of course, appearing, um, I think the inspiration was Margaret Thatcher. Um, the architect in New Zealand, of course, in this middle picture, everyone recognizes David Longy as the front man of the prime minister at the time, who was crusading against nuclear ships. But on the right, looking a little bit like a mafia boss, I think we've got Roger Douglas, the finance minister, who was really the driving force behind New Zealand's deregulatory approach. Now with this prevailing atmosphere coming out of Wellington and adopted I think throughout the business sector, um, this made the study of Southeast Asia or really any part of Asia quite difficult. Um, there was of course a flurry of interest in studying Japanese language and society, but uh, I think this had been spurred by a new realization of Japan's economic weight. And Southeast Asia could not match this and it could not match the largesse in terms of funding for language study. Um, so there really wasn't much uh, institutional support for studying Southeast Asia, because if you see the region as a market, you have squeezed out really much of what is interesting about what is going on in politics and society and culture and, and the rest of it. So what we have in, in New Zealand in the way of Southeast Asian studies, I think is, is individual, individual scholars doing their thing. And some of them doing it, you know, at an extraordinarily um, productive and um, with great recognition in the world, in the, in the wider scholarly world. And I've got two examples of James Oki, who I see is on the program for this conference. Um, James Oki, of course, professor um, of politics down in Canterbury. Um, now he did his PhD in Cornell, uh, completed in 1992 on uh, Thai politics. Uh, and then he pops up, I'm not quite sure exactly when he came to Canterbury, but he pops up um, in, by 1997, at least he's a lecturer down in the Department of Politics in Canterbury and where he has remained as one of the leading scholars of Thai politics um, globally, uh, continuing to work from a New Zealand base. And of course, there are plenty of others who are also doing excellent work on the region. Um, when I went into the Victoria University of Wellington um, staff directory not long ago, uh, it told me that there were 124 people whose names come up when you put in Southeast Asia as a keyword. But when I started to check what they were actually teaching, uh, almost none of them were teaching anything that had Southeast Asia in the course title. I found one special topic on Asian, Southeast Asian civilizations and the terms East Asia and Asia crop up in some international relations courses. But largely it seems that scholars who are working on the region are not teaching the region uh, in any sustained and institutionalized way. And I would count myself among those people since I have come back to New Zealand um, for nearly 11 years at the University of Auckland. 
I have never taught a course with Asia, Southeast Asia, or any Asian country's name in the course title. Um, I think that this situation has something to do with the way that our universities function, but also the way uh, the, we have sort of institutionalized our approaches to understanding the region, which is even when um, those in the corridors of power recognize that uh, we needed a broader lens, it's not just a matter of charting trade flows, um, the way they did it has produced uh, gaps, significant gaps in the way that we teach and understand the region. So let me start the story with these three institutions. The Asian New Zealand Foundation, which was established in 1994, then known as the Asia 2000, um, supposedly a public private venture, but it's always been heavily funded by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, and then, of course, the New Zealand Asia Institute, established by Nicholas Tarling and his colleagues in 1995 and, and opened by President, uh, Prime Minister Mahathir of Malaysia. There is a plaque in the business school, which I wanted to go into the building and take a, a photo of, but I'm not allowed back in as yet. Um, but it was one that I was quite interested to see when I arrived there. And then most recently, the Centres for Asia Pacific Excellent which were launched, which became operational in 2017. Um, and there was a Southeast Asia one hosted at Victoria University. Um, I want to just dig in a little bit into these three institutions, because um, I think they tell us a bit about this country. So if we look first at the Asian New Zealand Foundation, I see it's a sponsor for today's conference. Um, uh, this is, um, an independent but government funded organization. It retains very strong links with the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, in fact. Um, and it is an establishment organization. This picture um, of the two men, two gentlemen, um, we have former minister Philip Burden and former foreign minister Don McKinnon cutting the cake for the Asia New Zealand Foundation's 25th birthday party um, in 2019. It runs a very active program of outreach to schools. Um, it organizes and promotes person-to-person -person dialogues both within New Zealand and between New Zealand and particular groups in Asian countries. Um, it conducts surveys, it um, commissions certain kinds of research, uh, but of a very particular kind. It does not do scholarly research. And I say this as someone who has contracted in the past to the Asian New Zealand Foundation. Um, these, these Bits of research are intended um, for a much more general audience, as, as I understand it, rather than a scholarly audience. Um, New Zealand Asia Institute, uh, set up in the mid 90s. Um, and if I read the account of setting up the NZAI that Nicholas Tarling wrote in his book, Imparting Asia, um, it's a tale of trying to set up something outside of Asian studies. Um, that would explicitly include politics and business and economics and other disciplines of contemporary relevance to government and others. But in Tarling's own account, it was shaped by tensions within the university at the time um, which, with what was then called Asian studies. And one of the outcomes was uh, essentially a non-compete clause. That the decision was that NZAI would not teach um, and it would do research only, and it would also undertake a kind of inter-university diplomacy function of maintaining relationships with university administrators and scholars in the region. And it was indeed actually attached to the international office for some years, uh, but eventually it kind of, nobody wanted it, it seems, um, at the University of Auckland, and it arrived in the business school in 2009, and under my own watch as director um, in 2016, it moved from being a university level research institute to being a business school research center, um, basically recognizing that it was wholly funded by the business school and the business school, I guess, wanted to know a bit more about what it would be doing for the business school. Um, finally, the CAPES um, set up as the uh, 
on the initiative of the then uh, National Minister for State Owned Enterprises, uh, State Owned Enterprises, Economic Development and Science and Innovation, Stephen Joyce but carried on by the Labour government when they um, came to power in 2017. Now, the CAPES were set up with quite a substantial funding, 34 million over four years. Um, but they really have very little to do with the universities, even though they are hosted by the universities. If you look at the advisory board, some of whom are figured there, they are all people with incredibly impressive credentials in the business world, in public service, uh, but not scholars of Asia. Um, and that graphic representation of the CAPES activity that I showed at the beginning, that really captures, I think, the impetus, which is, to, you know, to make contact with students, to brief the local business community, um, to produce a very, very sorts of New Zealand focused, New Zealand relevant uh, little bits of information which are then disseminated out. Um, so there is no sustained support for the study of Southeast Asia from the Capes because they are in fact precluded from doing any such thing. And two out of the three Capes directors now are not academics. The Capes are not allowed to actually teach students in four credits courses and so they walk a very narrow pathway in terms of what they can do um, they perform a valuable function but they don't support southeast asian studies as as i would recognize it um, let me just move on to the humanities orientation sorry i'm seeking to get, keep going ahead of myself here in asian studies which um, New Zealand Asia Institute, Asia, not the New Zealand, New Zealand Asian Studies ended Asia commissioned a study um, back in 2003, um, uh, which was published as Knowing Asia. And it pointed out that there was a very entrenched humanities orientation in the study of Southeast Asia, or well, Asia more generally in, the re in, in this country and big gaps when it came to the teaching of anything to do with Asia, particularly in the business disciplines and in, in large areas of the social sciences. Um, and I would say not much, has, not much has changed since that Knowing Asia book was published, um, except that perhaps two things. One is that um, uh, Asian studies in most universities in New Zealand, if not all of them, has kind of disappeared in an institutional organizational sense in that departments of Asian studies have been folded into schools of cultures, languages and linguistics and has therefore lost that sort of um, visibility in organizational terms. And second, that there are even fewer courses dedicated to teaching on the region um, now than there were 15 years ago. Um, I think this, this end was kind of foretold by Nicholas Tarling when he attempted to set up the New Zealand Asia Institute uh, to be separate from the Asian studies departments. Um, but that decision or, or that uh, settlement that the New Zealand Asia Institute would not teach means that it had no bread and butter income from student revenues. And therefore, it was going to be um, totally reliant on the hiring decisions of the disciplinary departments as to whether they would hire people with particular expertise or interests in Asia. Um, and I think that trends in the university system and the disciplines mean that they have had fewer and fewer reasons to hire Asia experts. Um, so, if I just do a very quick skate through of this um, disciplinary evolution, uh, I think right back in 1978, uh, Benedict Anderson wrote a highly cited article on Thai studies in which he kind of pointed out that the promise of area studies, which is that you would take a truly broad and multidisciplinary approach to studying a part of the world had already been narrowed in terms of studies of the Thai state by people who really took a kind of narrow political science disciplinary lens and just studied one country. Um, it is, of course, very difficult to do both the discipline and the area. 
um, it is possible to combine them for sure. Um, this middle picture here uh, showcases um, the scholarship of somebody who until recently was in New Zealand, Sharon Graham Davis at the University at Auckland University of Technology, who combines a trained disciplinary anthropologist's eyes and toolkit with a very deep and intimate knowledge of Indonesian language, uh, Indonesian society, and the ability to conduct field work on the ground in Indonesia. This research, the title you can see here, was commissioned by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade in New Zealand, but you'll see from the repository at the top that uh, it is um, Sharon has now moved to Monash, where she is the Herb Heath uh, Professor for the Engagement of Indonesia at Monash University. What I think is the more dominant trend in the discipline is for the region and the empirical content and the place specificity to kind of be buried. And at the New Zealand Asia Institute, we have tried to unbury some of this in our research snapshot series where we take uh, recently published research. In this case, it's a piece from a marketing scholar, um, which is based on Asian empirics. Um, but in the actual journal that it was published in, a marketing journal, there is no demand for Asia-specific or country-specific work. It needs to be presented in much broader disciplinary terms. Um, in the snapshots, we bring out context, but in the, in the actual research for an ambitious scholar of marketing, you can't afford to have too much of a area or country specific lens if you want to hit those top tier journals. I realize I'm running a little bit out of time. Um, we had a bit of a late start. I guess I wanted to ask the question of whether um, New Zealand can join a platform co for collaboration. If Asian studies is becoming more and more not about deep and contextual knowledge of one particular country or one particular region and becomes more about working with scholars in the region. Um, can we be part of that? Uh, I think that it is of course possible, um, but it is something that we are are, are hindered by um, some of their, our own sort of institutional legacies. And one of them I've mentioned, which is the sort of the humanities tilt for Asian studies. Um, but the, there are other issues as well. And one of them would be around learning the language. Um, so we have, as well as it's sort of importing the, the, the old Asian studies oriental departments uh, from the United Kingdom, we also imported the three-year PhD. And then three years to do your PhD is just not enough to learn the language as well as learn the discipline and learn the statistical techniques and so on that you might need to become an accomplished social scientist, for example. We also can't learn the language because there is no university teaching of Southeast Asian languages, um, which obviously puts us at a disadvantage compared to Chinese and Japanese and Korean, which are still taught. But for a PhD student, as I've discovered in New Zealand, even if the language course is there, you can't actually assign a PhD student to take an undergraduate language course because um, the university administrators won't let you. So the options that the, our students might have to become deeply familiar with the region would really rest on being able, if they could, to join in with these um, other kinds of institutionalized programs for language study, the CSE program um, that's hosted at the University of Wisconsin for many, many decades, Australia's Achichis program for the study of Indonesia, which has already branched out to training people, not just who will be Indonesia experts, but who will be public health experts, who will be um, geologists or other people who will travel in, in Indonesia um, for a whole pile of uh, scholarly purposes that really don't necessarily re relate to old style Indonesian studies, but it's a way of maintaining the connections and understanding of Indonesia in this much more of a sort of platform collaboration way. Um, the final thing that I think will shape our ability to engage with the region 
um, in scholarly terms is of course the fact that the region is changing itself. Um, and this could be a talk in, in its own right. But um, that picture on the left is of the Indonesian Institute of Social Sciences, which used to be the organization that you had to go to if you wanted your research permit. Um, and it was a difficult and arduous process to get then, and it has become even more so in recent years because many countries in Southeast Asia are not willing to see foreign scholars come in and sort of roam around and do what they will want, which was, I think, the practice in the past. Um, the other feature of the region that is changing, of course, is that it, while 20 years ago, people spoke quite hopefully of it being a democratizing or liberalizing region, it is now um, not. The five of the 10 countries of ASEAN don't even pretend to be any kind of a democracy. And the other five uh, are clearly somewhat controlled or illiberal democracies. That picture, of course, is from the aftermath of street protests against the military takeover in Myanmar at the start of this year. This makes it a very difficult region to go and visit, um, in particularly in the places that are more overtly uh, in the midst of political conflict or crackdowns. Um, alongside the uh, the efforts to control foreign research on the part of authorities in Malaysia and Indonesia and other countries. I will note that our own research ethics office officers have sort of formed an unholy alliance uh, by saying that you they will not give you permission to do research unless you have this permit, um, as well as placing a great many other restrictions on how you're supposed to do your research in the field. I think the upshot is that I, for one, will never do uh, research in the field using human subjects in Southeast Asia from a New Zealand university because these obstacles are actually very difficult to navigate. Other, others manage to do so, but uh, one, of the, one of the consequences of these shifts in the region um, and as well as the disciplinary shifts is that Southeast Asians scholars themselves are taking increasingly important roles in the study of the region. And rather than the Southeast Asianist being a kind of lone scholar who went off into the field for many years, um, they would emerge much more, they, they were now people in the region are doing much more of the research themselves and they are playing a leading role in as collaborators and partners rather than um, simply passive sort of observers of foreigners uh, coming in. I see we're, we're kind of out of time, so I'm going to stop here. I hope that there will still be time for some um, Q&A given that we were a little late in beginning. Is that permitted, uh, Ruben? Yes, uh, good morning Good morning to everyone again, Natasha. Thank you very much for your uh, fascinating presentation and um, walking us through the you know development and evolution of uh, South Asian studies, uh, the accomplishments and the, the shortcomings. Um, so you, you, yeah, you will stop your presentation, please. Um, so um, we do have, I have, uh, I have, I'm allowed to um, uh, give you some more time uh, for questions. And I, th I see there are several already appearing. Can you read them or? Uh... Yes, I, I can see these cute questions. Um... And uh, let me take them in the order that they're presented, right. Jason, Jason Young. Um, so he has a question on how can New Zealand better channel funding into building research capacity in New Zealand universities? Oh, I mean, the funding issue is a really important one, of course. Um, we're far from the region. It takes time and money to go there, even when we're not stuck with COVID. Um, Look, speaking frankly, I think that it's a real shame that the CAPES uh, took the shape that they did with, the, with the, the mandate that they did because that 34 million could have been put to um, much better ends. Um, I think though the funding has to go into, um, has to be attached to a kind of ongoing revenue stream for the scholars and their institutions. And so therefore I think that the more sustainable way of funding probably comes from um, making sure that we teach courses on Asia and so that therefore there is a demand to hire people with Asia expertise. Um, and that then when we when we hire them, we have a use for them in teaching. And that is how we, we grow the next generation of, of research students and others. Um, and then those students are the ones who can probably 
uh, make use of, of the scholarships that, for instance, the Asia New Zealand Foundation does fund scholarships um, for students to, to go to the field. Um, but you have to have the student interest to start with. And so I think it kind of begins with doing more to embed the teaching of the research, uh, teaching of the region or countries in the region in, in the work that we do. So that means a lot of conversations within the department or the work unit. Um, and I guess also it means making sure that what we're teaching is, is engaging and relevant to students and that, that it does spark an interest uh, in the region. Sorry, that's a very surface response. Um, let me have a look at some of the other questions. Uh, Jordan King, um, personal sense would be as an ideal state for university teaching and research if politics were no barrier. That's, uh, politics is always a barrier. Um, I would like to see um, greater institutional valuing of um, understanding different countries and societies in the region on their own terms. I, I find it very um, frustrating to always be asked for the New Zealand angle, um, whether that's from government or from the business community, because it's very, very short-sighted to be, to be constantly reducing the region to how much more can we sell and how, what is the best way to sell or to, you know, to, to kind of pursue our own bilateral interests in these places. And I think it doesn't actually, even in an instrumental sense, it doesn't serve us very well because um, if, if our motives are that transparently instrumental, I don't think you know, that that goes un, unnoticed on the other side. So my ideal state would, I guess, revolve around a bit more of um, teaching the region for its own sake. And I guess that means teaching it in, in you know, the, the accomplishments and the, the good stuff, the, the, the success stories, but also looking at the stuff that, you know, is, is, is less, less appealing. And I think one of the things we could do is actually use that comparative framework of the region but also bring New Zealand into it. Um, it amazes me that a New Zealand as a multi-ethnic society doesn't compare itself to Malaysia more, or more often, um, that our colonial uh, heritage um, that we live with to, that, to this day is not um, compared more actively to the colonialism in Southeast Asia or Malaysia or elsewhere. Um, I think we could, we could bring ourselves into that comparative lens quite a lot more. Um, let me have a look uh, at some of the other questions. Um, I have one from Sita, um, the state of matters that can be extended to other regions as well. The tension between disciplinary imperatives and the context of the basis for scholarly knowledge as the basis for teaching is an impasse and I can't see a way through. And I, and, I, and I sometimes feel like that myself, I must say, as someone who tries to straddle the discipline um, and the region. Um, and, I, and I would say that some disciplines are more hospitable than others um, to accommodating space for work that, that is informed in disciplinary terms and is theoretically engaged and can speak to other people in whether it's political science or sociology or anthropology, but is also informed by a very sustained knowledge of a particular part of the world. Um, I think that um, there is obviously no easy solution. And particularly if you're a scholar who wants to make your way through the promotion obstacles in your discipline, that means publishing in disciplinary journals and, 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 and hitting those, those sorts of international metrics. I can't speak for other disciplines, but I can say that for, for political science broadly, there is still place for um, qualitative embedded work that kind of ticks two boxes. Um, I was actually involved in a workshop um, around 2004, which came out, um, it was a workshop held in Stanford. Um, it came out a few years later in a book called Theory, Region and Qualitative Method, which was an attempt by a group of political scientists, um, was edited by Eric Kuhonta, Tuong Vu and Dan Slater. These are political scientists who work on Southeast Asia, who were trying to um, actively kind of rescue both the qualitative tradition in Southeast Asian studies uh, and 
political science in a disciplinary sense. And they were pointing out that this, this doesn't need to be an insurmountable obstacle. And, and I don't see why that shouldn't work for anthropology and, and sociology and many other disciplines. I mean, probably some of the most influential work in, in anthropology, Clifford Geertz, um, was um, conducted you know, research in Bali uh, in Southeast Asia. So it's possible, um, I just think it means staking your claim in the discipline for work that has a strong empirical component that doesn't reduce, um, doesn't, you know, doesn't, doesn't reduce the, the region or the country to just a data set because Asia as data set is, I mean, sure, there can be good work done and then it could be, it could be Chinese bank employees one day and it could be Colombian coffee growers the next day. But to me, you miss something if, if context is, is reduced to being such an incidental factor. Um, so I think it means integrating this uh, into the discipline a bit more. Um, uh, Natasha, I'm afraid uh, we are starting to get some comments already. Oh, we are getting uh, comments as well? Yeah, and okay. maybe for the comments part, <laughs> maybe there is, a, there is a way to discuss them um, separately because I'm worried that in about five minutes time, the, ne the next round of sessions will be starting. But uh, so I, 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 I'm sorry if I am sounding a little undiplomatic <laughs> and rude here, but uh, I am under strict instructions. Um, it was, as I said, a fascinating presentation. And I, I myself uh, have a number of questions which I am not uh, able to ask you, in, particularly in the context of the, 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 the concerns about the, a, a, a new Cold War a scenario and perhaps our Southeast Asian studies starting to focus again, primarily on the strategic context. Um, but uh, there are also possibly some opportunities as we look at uh, Pacific studies and Pacific research in the maritime context, there could be opportunities to make, I know some scholars are already doing that, comparisons between the, the Pacific um, development and, and Southeast Asia and uh, South China Sea and the Pacific. So hopefully um, Southeast Asian studies is not doomed. And with your inspirational talk, I hope the universities will respond and react. And we have a round table. Jordan King asked that question, but he's running a round table tomorrow to look at how universities are uh, advancing uh, Asian studies and definitely South Asian would be part of that. So with that, I would like to thank you very warmly for, for your presentation and wish you all the best. Stay safe in Auckland. Um, as some of us uh, have to be very careful and cautious um, and um, invite you to participate in other sessions if you can. Thank you very much. And that's the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.